언젠가부터 한국에 대한 세계인들의 관심이 하늘을 찌르더니 오늘날에는 한국을 객관적으로 연구하는 학문이 급 몰살을 타고 있습니다. 한국계 미국 혼혈인 데이비드 강 교수는 한국과 한국을 둘러싼 국제관계를 분석하고 강연하는 인물인데요. 그는 지난해 한국의 역사와 국제적 관계에 대해 미국인들을 상대로 한국이 얼마나 큰 나라이며 왜 미국이 한국을 연구해야 하는지에 대해 강의를 한 적이 있습니다. 한국인들의 특징에 대해 재미있고 흥미롭게 풀어나갔는데요. 함께 보시겠습니다. But rather to give you a sense of the contours of what Korea has gone through up until today. Because clearly, in, in, you know, even if we spent a whole week, I wouldn't be able to do all the, all the details of Korea. But I want you guys to take away some of the things that I find most interesting about why Korea is uh, something worth studying. It is worth trying to figure out why it has been uh, so ge geopolitically important. As I'm sure Mary told you earlier, uh, Korea is interesting geographically because there's, there's a lot of things we say the most, the biggest, etc. in the world, but this is actually true. It's the only place in the world where the interests of the four major superpowers literally touch each other. And what I mean by that is, like, if you go to India or Iran or Iraq, USA is 10,000 miles away, Russia is 10,000, you know. Here, whoops, Korea shares land borders with Russia and China. Its closest relation uh, to Japan is 50 miles by ferry. And of course, as many of you know, the United States had at one time 100,000 troops and nuclear weapons on the peninsula, and now we have 30,000 troops. So the four biggest economies, the four biggest countries in the world are literally nose to nose on the Korean peninsula. 데이비드 강 교수가 첫 번째로 꼽은 한국이 흥미로운 이유는 한국이 가진 지리적 특성인데요. 한국은 네 개의 주요 강대국들이 서로 접하고 있는 유일한 지역이라고 했습니다. 한반도는 4대 경제 강국과 모두 가까우면서 국경을 공유하고 있습니다. 한국은 경제와 정치적 흐름에 민감하게 반응하며 인접국들과 영향을 주고받을 수밖에 없기 때문에 흥미롭다고 말했죠. 이어서 데이비드 강 교수는 한국을 주목해야 하는 두 번째 이유로 단기간 안에 이루어진 한국의 눈부신 경제 성장을 이야기하죠. How many of you have a Samsung or an LG phone, TV, etc. Hyundai car, right? Korea's had an economic miracle in many ways. It's one of the things when I teach my undergraduate, my MBA class, that we, f we spend time on. How did they grow so fast? But this chart is particularly vivid because it's not just are we richer than we were before, because every country is basically richer than they were before. But often we want to measure, are you catching up to the richest countries, or in, in this case, the United States? If you go back to 1950, uh, the red is Mexico and the blue is Brazil, but they're not really closing the gap in terms of wealth compared to the United States. The United States is getting richer just as they're getting richer. This is the case for most countries around the world outside of Europe. So why are Korea, Taiwan, these kind of countries so interesting? But rather than a sort of up and down thing, it's almost a direct line upwards. So that by 2004, they're over 50% as rich as the United States. And they've continued to close the gap. These numbers just haven't been updated. And you can see that if you ever go to Seoul, if you, anyone goes to Korea, Japan, Taiwan, these countries in many ways are more sophisticated, <laughs> more technologically intense than um, uh, American countries. Yes. So we have uh, the world's largest shipbuilder is Hyundai or, or South Korea and Hyundai Heavy Industries, right? Um, Samsung and, and LG are now global brands. So in many ways, uh, we know South Korean companies. They've managed to transform themselves in ways. And that's so one reason, even if you don't have Korean students or direct in, in, uh, interactions with Koreans, why it's an interesting story. Because this is truly amazing what the, South, uh, what the East Asian countries have done, particularly South Korea and Taiwan. How did they do this? How did they catch up and nobody else caught up? 한국은 다른 나라들과는 차별화된 경이로운 속도로 미국을 따라잡으며 끝없이 성장하는 모습을 보여주고 있다고 강 교수는 말했습니다. 이어서 강 교수는 역사적으로 봤을 때도 한국이 놀라운 특성을 가진 나라라는 설명을 이어가죠. 한국은 잦은 외세의 침략에도 국경에 미미한 변화만 있었을 뿐 굳건하게 천년 넘게 존재해온 나라라고 설명하는데요. Uh, and I'm going to give you a different story actually, and one that one that shows a lot more stability in East Asia. In Europe, you had a bunch of similarly sized states, kingdoms, whatever, that spent centuries 
beating the uh, stuffing out of each other. So this is, this is Europe in 1300, and we have a whole bunch of political units here that don't exist anymore. Now in contrast, in, in, in East Asia, the four main states of East Asia, Japan, Korea, Vietnam, and China, have basically existed for well over a thousand years. Their borders changed a little bit. And so Korea became Korea around the seventh century. These are deeply, deeply uh, long-lived kingdom. East Asia has a very different historical sense of international relations and what we would call as hierarchic, not equality. Informally, the big countries, China, left everybody alone. They didn't really interfere in South Korean or Korean domestic politics at all. Formally, you're saying, yeah, you're, you're an emperor, I'm only a king. But informally, the Chinese didn't care. They just wanted to make sure you understood where the rank order was. 동아시아의 계층 구조에 따라 형식적으로는 중국보다 아래의 나라로 보였을지라도 실질적으로는 중국이 전혀 관여하거나 개입하지 않았음을 짚어주기도 했습니다. 다시 말해 한국은 독자적으로 유지되고 성장해온 나라라는 것이죠. 이는 중국과 한국의 600년간의 관계를 다룬 오드 아렌의 베스타 교수의 견해와도 상통하는 것입니다. 이어 강 교수는 한국의 역사에 있었던 일본의 식민 지배와 광주 민주화 운동을 대며 한국인들 특유의 민족성을 이야기합니다. And obviously for Koreans who had been a strong, proud country, proud of their accomplishments, for literally unified since the 6th century AD, is extraordinarily humiliating. And the best example I can give that to you is this is the, the, the king's palace. And what the Japanese did in the center of that palace is build their administrative building right over the top. Extraordinarily humiliating, you can imagine. Right, if there was, and again, the example, of course, if in D.C. in front of the Washington Monument, the Soviets build a big uh, onion dome thing, right? It'd be... Now, the reason that uh, many of you can't see it today is finally, uh, a couple of years ago, they decided to tear down this building. And we had a, a, a very dramatic democratic transition in 1987. And here's one thing about Koreans, which I, which I will point out, right? Uh, this is the other side. This is not a sort of we're, you know, you're the king, we're the peasants, you can do whatever you want. When Koreans aren't happy with something, they let you know. <laughs> really interesting, right? There is a deeply, I'm not going to call it democratic, but egalitarian strand in Korean society, which says, I'm as good as anybody, and it's my right to tell you what to do. And they didn't like what the government was doing, and uh, now we have democracy today. <laughs> We, it took us a long time to get to where we are today, where even though we hate it, actually, I'm not sure, I think we're going backwards right now. But <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Korea has a lot of things to be proud of. The economic development, this transition to <laughs> democracy. I should put another picture on, but like people vote, right? There is a, a movement towards better freedom of press, freedom of speech, things like that, right? 강 교수는 강의 내내 한국이 참 흥미롭다고 몇 번이나 말했습니다. 식민 지배, 분단, 전쟁, 군사 쿠데타, 민주화 운동을 위해 거리로 나온 시민들까지. 한국은 현대화 과정에서의 어려움을 매우 잘 이겨냈다고 강 교수는 얘기했죠. 한 시간 넘짓한 데이비드 강 교수의 강연 속에서 단기간 동안 한국이 겪어온 격동의 역사를 느껴볼 수 있었는데요. 대한민국은 역사적으로 어떤 위기와 어려움이 닥쳐와도 훌륭하게 극복해내며 오늘날에는 멋진 성장과 발전만을 이뤄내고 있습니다. 한국인들에게는 오래전부터 지배자도 어쩔 수 없는 누구든 할수 있다 라는 평등의식이 있었던 덕에 온갖 역경을 이겨낼 수 있었고 오늘날 한국이 강대국으로 자리 잡을 수 있었던 것이 아닌가 싶습니다.